Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if those of you on your feet could please resume your seats. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. He told me not to mention this, but I was just, uh, when I sat down after my introduction, I spoke to Stephen Fox and he had his back to me and uh, he refused to answer. And, uh, and then it was pointed out to me that I'd called him Stephen and not Stuart. And I don't know how that happened, but uh, anyway, I won't be invited back, so I'll try and go out with a bang tonight. Good to have you here, Stuart. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Martin Flanagan. Martin played and coached footy in the 1970s at the University of Tasmania. He was a popular and colourful figure at an amateur football club with myriad colourful figures and riotous social life. Remarkably, the club not only survived the era, but actually managed to win a few premierships along the way. Martin had a keen sense of the ridiculous, but this was rounded with the curiosity of an intellectual. Upon completing his studies, he took himself off to see the world before coming home and landing a job in journalism with Northern Tasmania's Examiner newspaper. Quickly demonstrating he was a writer with a difference, he soon moved to Melbourne and would subsequently enrich the pages of The Age for over 30 years. His writing has covered such terrain as war, Indigenous Australia, contemporary politics, family, and occasionally even our native state of Tasmania. But for all the serious stuff, football continued to drive him to creative excellence. Martin has written books on topics ranging across the full extent of football time. Tom Wills, the founder of the Australian game, the 1970 grand final, and just recently, the Western Bulldogs Premiership win of 2016. Tonight, he delivers the toast to football. Please welcome Martin Flanagan. If you drive through the Tasmanian Midlands from Launceston to Hobart, as you pass through a clump of houses called Cleveland, you will see on the left Joe Pike's paddock. This is where my father saw his first games of football as a child in the years immediately following World War I. My grandfather, a railway ganger who could write no more than his name, was the backbone of the Cleveland Football Club. These were the years before electricity, before radio. And so my father's earliest football memories were sitting around at night, listening to his father and older brothers talk about the difficulty of getting a team because so many of the local lads had died at Gallipoli or on the Western Front. But when Cleveland did get a team together, they played in Joe Pike's paddock. So that's where it starts for me, what I like to call my footy dreaming. Cleveland had something else. It had the memory of a champion. George Chalice was a mathematics teacher who played football on the wing and was renowned for his speed and accurate passing. Chalice had been one of Tasmania's best at the National Carnival of 1911 and one of Carlton's best in the 1915 Grand Final when they overcame Collingwood. <laughs> Within 12 months, Sergeant George Chalice was blown to pieces in France. Nothing whatsoever of him remained, but a large gravestone stands in his memory in the small churchyard opposite Joe Pike's paddock. What have I got from football? Memories, lots of them. In the aftermath of World War I, a young returned soldier who had been gassed and wounded and lost two brothers in the slaughter, took up land outside La Trobe on Tasmania's northwest coast. My grandfather, Patrick Flanagan, followed La Trobe, having lived in the district since he was a boy. The story my grandfather told was that one day, the returned soldier turned up at the cattle sales and had a kick with some of the local blokes 
and was persuaded to have a game with Latrobe. His name was Ivor Warren Smith. He would later win two Brownlow medals with Melbourne and as chairman of selectors, be the power behind the throne during the 1950s and 60s when Norm Smith's Melbourne side won six premierships. My grandfather only went to Hobart once in his life. That was to see Warren Smith lead the North West Football Union against the hated TFL, the Hobart-based association that thought it was the VFL and sought to rule accordingly. <laughs> Warren Smith was injured early and the union lost. Well, that was how the story came down to me 60 years later. That's a long time for a story to travel, but something about the Australian game, some innate power it possesses, has been able to propel stories with rare power. That is why the pre-match entertainment before this year's Dreamtime at the G game may be the most powerful message Aboriginal Australia sends non-Aboriginal Australia this year. My mother's family, the Learys, were farmers in the Green Hills up behind Devonport. They were musical people, but they had footy stories also. Before World War I, when a 20-year-old member of the clan lay dying from what was then called a leaking heart, his brother went to the grand final between Alveston and Devonport with two carrier pigeons, one to send, send home a score at half time, <laughs> the other to send home a score at the end of the game. <clears throat> My father, who was born in 1914, said that when he was a boy, Victorian football results were just a paragraph in the Tasmanian papers. Everyone followed Tasmanian football. The biggest club in his world as a child was Campbelltown, 20 kilometres to Cleveland South. All his life, Dad followed Tasmanian football. He never went to a single AFL or VFL game. I always said he didn't barrack for an AFL team, but when the Swans surged to that great premiership victory in 2005, I was amazed to find he wanted them to win. Why? Because of Laurie Nash. Dad left Launceston High School just as the Great Depression hit. He later survived the wartime atrocity remembered as the Burma Railway, but he said that in some ways the Great Depression was worse. In the Great Depression, he said, you saw whole families go under. One of the few bright spots in that bleak reality was Laurie Nash. If the word genius can be applied to sport, it could probably be used in relation to Nash. He would open the bowling for Australia and offer to bowl bounces back at Douglas Jardine's English team during the bodyline crisis. In Launceston football, he played for the City Club under captain coach Roy Cazali. They were state premiers in 1930 and 32. In 1933, he joined South Melbourne, playing centre-half back against the wind and centre-half forward with it, and was a member of the Swans' famous Foreign Legion Premiership team of that year. The City Club, now called South Launceston, can trace its heritage back to the 1870s through the Cornwall Club. In 2013, the AFL ushered South Launceston from the statewide league and replaced them with a so-called franchise. The franchise folded within two years. In the same year, the AFL foisted a name change upon the North Hobart Football Club, which can date its heritage back to 1881. A club that had made a cumulative profit of $300,000 in the preceding 10 years, made a loss of 100,000 over the next four years, lost three quarters of its paying members, and was headed like the Tasmanian Tiger for extinction until last year when a group of determined North Hobart people won back control of their club. They now have no debt and some of the best juniors in the state. Go North Hobart. <coughs> people ask me who I barrack for. I barrack for the game. An American who lived in this city for some years once wrote me a letter which began, you seem an intelligent man, why do you write so much about football? Because it's the culture I'm from, footy's a language I speak. I also happen to believe Australian football is, by world standards, a great game, that it is, in fact, Australia's great athletic invention. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Victorian detective Sherlock Holmes, watched the 1920 VFL grand final between Collingwood and Richmond 
and declared that the Australian game was the most athletic of all the football codes. I was fascinated when I discovered it as an 11 year, year old growing up in Burnie on Tasmania's northwest coast. Five of the boys I played with or against went on to play in the VFL AFL. Between them, the two Burnie clubs, Burnie and Cooey, easily won the bulk of the premierships in that third of the island. I was therefore shocked to learn earlier this year that unable to field a team, Burnie had followed Devonport in withdrawing from the Tasmanian statewide league. Popular sports like Australian rules football are constantly reborn in the eyes of children. In my case, between the ages of 11 and 13. I was 11 when the game captivated me. I was 12 when I listened on a plastic transistor to the classic 1967 grand final between Geelong and Richmond. That same year I also saw the Tasmanian state final between North Hobart and Wynyard, which ended with the goalpost being pulled down by Wynyard supporters to prevent North Hobart full forward Dickie Collins shooting for goal. <laughs> Wynyard supporters having judged that he marked the ball after the siren. When I spoke earlier this year at a function in Hobart celebrating the rebirth of the North Hobart Football Club, Dickie Collins attended and brought the ball. <laughs> the ball he was holding when the goalposts were pulled down 51 years earlier. The umpire, a man with the marvellously symbolic name of Pilgrim, never got to blow his whistle to end the match. <laughs> the game is still being played, I like to say, out in the football dream time. I have to thank football for the stories it has given me, hundreds if not thousands of them. Here are a few that come to mind. Liam Jarrah. I say in all seriousness, it is doubtful that any professional sportsman playing in any major league anywhere in the world vaulted a bigger cultural gap than Liam Jarrah did to play AFL football. He may also come to be seen in the history of the game as Albert Namajira is seen in the history of Australian art. My second story would be the Israeli-Palestinian AFL peace team. What was so moving about the peace team was that through the medium of Australian football, two of the most conflicted groups on earth actually bought into the idea that they were one. The Israeli assault on Gaza in 2014 eventually tore them apart, but even so, one of the Israelis bravely continued the work. Thirdly, in Tom Wills, I found a character who is to me like Ned Kelly, a figure who straddles a fault line in the national psyche, who is best understood in the way that earthquakes are understood, the product of vast forces mostly unseen that suddenly erupt through an individual. Tom Wills, like Ned Kelly, is a big story in the continuing drama of what it means to be Australian. My fourth story would be driving from Melbourne to Darwin with Michael Long, crossing this great continent of ours from south to north with someone who was known every time he stepped out of the car. My fifth is the Bulldogs coming from nowhere to win in 2016. I, <laughs> I could go on and on and on. I knew Tasmanian football was in serious trouble four years ago when I went to Hobart and the sports report on the evening news led with soccer. Not EPL or A-League, but local soccer. Tasmanian soccer had replaced Tasmanian football as the dominant sporting story. This is not unrelated, I believe, to the fact that Tasmania has had only a single draft pick in the past two years. The power of Tasmanian football as a dreaming is much diminished. Four years ago, when I started asking round, I found to my disbelief that the Tasmanian statewide league had been unable to secure a financial sponsor. Clubs were struggling to get sponsors for individual players. This was at a time when back in Melbourne, the AFL was congratulating itself on the fact that it, is, it had secured a record sum for broadcasting rights to the game. How, I asked, could this be happening at the one time, such extremes of poverty and wealth within the one game, the one culture? Two years ago, the Glenorchy Football Club, John President, John McCann, said that the ecosystem of Tasmanian football was sick. He was right on two counts. He was right that it was sick, and he was right that the grassroots game, the growth of more than 150 years, is best understood as an ecosystem. The AFL and those around them talk about the industry. 
If football is an industry, it is at the most basic level a primary industry. But everywhere I go in Australia, I hear the same. That industry is struggling. And so tonight, in moving this toast, can I say to all those who love the game, and particularly to those who are responsible for its future, ignore grassroots football at your peril. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to be upstanding. To the Australian game. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. And you know, I was a kid back in 1967 as well, and my recollection of that game, which I didn't attend, it wasn't, it wasn't broadcast anywhere because the gate was actually protected. You couldn't even hear it on the radio. I had to rely from Devonport, 30 miles away from Burnie, on, uh, on, on radio quarter by quarter scores. And the final score took a while coming through because there was a fair bit to sort through um, in the minutes that followed the final siren and the goalpost being pulled out. <laughs> but um, it was a hell of a story. The Sporting Globe over here, I think the following week, you know, had it front and centre. And um, I was surprised why everyone was so shocked about it because it didn't seem a totally abnormal thing for me to happen in Tassie. <laughs> Stephen Smith, the president, will, uh, will, will give an appraisal, not a mark, but um, uh, he'll talk about what Martin has had to say and, uh, and what Bob says later on. Enjoy your main courses and we'll be back with uh, Bob Murphy's reply to Martin Flanagan shortly.